All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Boris uh, Ivanovich. Boris has been a PhD student in my group for the past uh, few years, and uh, he has been focusing on the topic of uh, trajectory forecasting. He has been uh, looking at this problem uh, along a number of uh, angles for from algorithms to forecast trajectories to how this capability interacts with uh, other capabilities in the autonomy stack. Uh, he has made a number of contributions uh, one of them, Trajectron Plus Plus, is currently considered uh, state of the art in uh, uh, the trajectory forecasting community. I routinely get emails from people asking me about details of his work, and uh, it's becoming <laughs> increasingly common that uh, I have just to forward emails to Boris say, please take care of the student, please take care of this other researcher. So Boris is certainly becoming very popular in the uh, community. And uh, Maurice, the stage is yours, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Marco, and thank you everyone for coming here. Um, so as Marco said, today I'm going to be talking about my PhD research on trajectory forecasting in the modern robotic autonomy stack. And in recent years, there's been a significant commercial effort in bringing robots to society in domains spanning autonomous driving, collaborative manufacturing, and assistive robots, such as those that help out in the home or in healthcare settings. And among these, self-driving cars are perhaps the most visible examples, with companies now like Waymo and Cruz actually obtaining licenses to operate uh, fully autonomously in uh, different parts of the Bay Area. And accordingly, scenarios with human-robot interaction will soon be everywhere and navigating them safely and smoothly is of critical importance. So taking an example from autonomous driving, one of the core challenges is that scenarios like merging onto a highway or driving through a four-way stop intersection are exercises in negotiation. And to show an example of what can happen when that goes wrong, in this video, we see a highway merge, which leads to a near standstill, which is pretty dangerous on a high-speed road like this. As humans, we constantly make decisions by reasoning about the future using a mental model of how other humans behave, also known as a theory of mind in psychology. Accordingly, reasoning about what might happen in the future is a critical capability. As a result, the goal of my PhD has broadly been to endow robots with this same capability. In other words, to build a computational model of human behavior. And in robotics, this, ab this ability to reason about what might happen in the future is generally known as multi-agent trajectory forecasting. And here's an illustration of what a set of forecasted trajectories might look like, with multiple arrows from each, each agent indicating multiple possible futures. So with this goal as the guide through my PhD, I really started uh, early on by making advancements in key areas in trajectory forecasting, such as presenting methods for handling time-varying numbers of agents uh, and accounting for agent dynamics, culminating in our latest trajectory plus plus mar uh, model, as Marco stated. Now, Trajectory forecasting usually operates as a module within an autonomy stack, taking inputs from perception and informing downstream planning and control. As a result, it is important to tightly couple these modules together in order to achieve good overall system performance. Now, coupling modules together can be done in many ways. In my PhD, I specifically focused on representation coupling and metrics coupling. Representation coupling refers to increasing the amount of information passed between modules. In particular, on the right here, we propose a new trajectory forecasting output representation, MATS, that is much more amenable to planning and control algorithms. And we present ways of incorporating additional information from perception into prediction, namely uncertainty. Finally, I also focused on module coupling via evaluation, proposing task or metrics that evaluate a module cognizant of its downstream task. Now, broadly, these works can be grouped into methods for trajectory forecasting, their integration within the rest of the autonomy stack, and how to evaluate the performance in meaningful ways. And these groups are what the rest of the talk will cover. Now, I've also had the pleasure of working on a variety of other projects and fields, but due to time constraints, I won't be covering these today. So in the first part of the talk, we'll dive into methods for trajectory forecasting, tackling the question of how can we predict the future accurately. And although we have a few contributions in this space, today I'll be focusing on our latest trajectory forecasting method, Trajectron++. To start, 
the problem of trajectory forecasting is how to predict where agents might be in the future, given observations of where they were in the past. These observations generally take the form of a set of states obtained from sensors, for example, position, velocity, orientation. And predictions take the form of a set of future states or distributions of states. Now, since this is quite an open problem, there are many existing approaches for trajectory forecasting. And they can broadly be broken down into ontological and phenomenological methods. Ontological methods typically postulate some structure about the problem, whether that be a set of rules that agents follow or rough formulations of agents' internal decision-making schemes. Phenomenological approaches, on the other hand, do not make such assumptions, instead relying on a wealth of data to glean agent behaviors without reasoning about underlying motivations. And within ontological methods, there are typically states-based models, which predict human motion using differential equations. And then there are internal cost function-based approaches, which reason about an agent's internal decision-making process. And it's best exemplified by methods from inverse reinforcement learning and game theory. On the other side, phenomenological methods can be typically subdivided into deterministic regressors, such as social LSTM, which predict only one trajectory per agent, and generative approaches, which predict a distribution of trajectories per agent. And within generative approaches, there are methods that produce analytical distributions whose likelihood functions are efficient to compute, such as discrete conditional variational autoencoders, or CDAEs. And there are methods which produce empirical distributions from which one can only sample, such as generative adversarial networks. Since analytical distributions provide strictly more information and they're some of the most widely used approaches in practice, they will be the focus of today's talk. Here, I have a table showing some of the latest phenomenological methods in the field, as well as which considerations they account for. Due to the field's popularity, there's been a plethora of strong approaches covering a wide variety of core considerations, such as multimodality, uh, which is the possibility of uh, having many possible futures, uh, variable numbers of agents, the incorporation of heterogeneous data, and more. However, one of the most important considerations, at least from a robotics perspective, has been neglected, and that is a consideration of dynamics. This is especially important as most of these methods directly predict in position space, which doesn't necessarily capture dynamical constraints. For example, the fact that cars cannot move sideways, but instead travel along arcs. And to remedy this, we present Trajectron++, a recurrent graph-structured neural network that explicitly accounts for multimodality, which, as I mentioned, is the possibility for multiple high-level futures, dynamics, and scene context. And it's also future conditional, which means that its predictions can be conditioned on the robot's future motion plan. And I'll talk about this capability more in a few slides. Trajectron++ operates by first abstracting the scene into a spatial-temporal graph modeling agents as nodes and their interactions as edges. And then to predict a particular node, say card number one here, all we need to do is encode that node's history and that of its neighbors, along with any additional scene context into a vector. This vector then conditions the conditional variational autoencoder or CDAE, which produces a multimodal distribution over possible high-level futures, each of which are then integrated through our dynamics-aware decoder which guarantees that the predictions obey agent dynamics. And to illustrate what that dynamics aware decoder is doing, let's, let's say we wanted to forecast a car's trajectory. In this work, we model vehicles as dynamically extended unicycles, the dynamics for which are shown here. A vehicle state is, consists, uh, consists of its position, heading, and velocity along that heading. Its controls are omega, the steering rate, and A, its acceleration. At each time step, and for each high-level future, Trajectron++ predicts a Gaussian distribution over the agent's controls. The mean of, these, of this distribution is then integrated through the full nonlinear dynamics, and their uncertainty is propagated through locally linearized dynamics in order to obtain predictions in position space with uncertainty. And for those of you in the field, this is exactly the prediction step of an extended Kalman filter. To verify if this dynamics incorporation scheme actually works, we evaluated our method on a variety of data sets, one of which is the large scale real world new scenes data set. Here, we show the prediction errors of prior works as well as our method for new scenes vehicles as measured by the displacement error at a prediction horizon of three seconds. 
As can be seen, our base method, which predicts directly in position space, comes close to the best performing prior model, SPA-GNN, with the incorporation of dynamics yielding that extra performance that's really necessary to improve beyond it. And even actually when we submitted Chartron++ to a public prediction challenge last year, without any additional engineering by us for this challenge, our model came in third place, which is really encouraging. So qualitatively, what does this look like? Well, on the left, we can see our base model, which predicts directly in position space. And its problem is that it's confidently undershooting the turn. And we can see this because the ground truth white dashed line is not within the red predicted distribution cloud. Now in the middle with our dynamics integration scheme, we can really see that multimodality come out. With the ground truth now covered by some probability as well as the original, uh, you know, as well as that original straight trajectory. Adding in scene context in the form of a map finally snaps the prediction to the ground truth as the model is now able to understand the scene around the car, around the red car in particular. And although I mentioned earlier that Trajectron++ is future conditional, this capability only really shines when it's combined with a downstream planning control algorithm and is actually best exemplified by my colleagues' work. In particular, uh, Haruki Nishimura developed uh, a risk-sensitive control framework that incorporates Trajectron++ predictions uh, and when applied to a real world motion planning task, he found that using these predictions, which were conditioned on candidate motion plans, yielded the best resulting robot trajectories when it was incorporated with uh, his own uh, proposed planning and control architecture. The work even saw some news coverage when it was first released. In another line of work, Simon Schaefer, who was a visiting master student in the lab, compared Trajectron Plus Plus's predictions with and without conditioning to determine how much of an effect the ego robot has on other agents, which he then used to develop a motion planner, which is minimally invasive to other agents in the scene. So the key takeaways from this first work are that current data-driven prediction methods do not consider agent dynamics, but uh, predicting potentially infeasible trajectories. To remedy this, we present Trajectron++, a state-of-the-art trajectory forecasting method whose predictions obey agent dynamics. And lastly, Trajectron++ can condition its predictions on additional data, such as maps and the Eagle Robots feature motion plan, which are very helpful when combining Trajectron++ with downstream planning and control algorithms. So with a method for trajectory forecasting in hand, we next need to discuss how we can actually tightly integrate this prediction, uh, uh, prediction module with other autonomy stack modules, namely perception and planning. And we'll start by talking about the interface between prediction and planning. Currently, most trajectory forecasting methods produce future tracklets or distributions of them for each agent in a scene. And this is an intuitive output representation that matches common evaluation metrics. And I have here an illustration of what a tracklet is, which is really just a set of points with some information like position or, or velocity. However, a majority of planning and control algorithms reason about system dynamics rather than future agent tracklets. And so the goal of this work is to investigate more efficient output representations for planning and control. And really the question that we have here is, can we meet in the middle? Can we produce a dynamical system as our trajectory forecasting output? We can, and we propose maths as our method for doing so. And in particular, to, to dive into how it works, while most methods produce tracklets, which are then fed into planning and control, our method instead produces a dynamical system, which is represented by this colored matrix, which is instead fed into planning control. However, it can also still produce tracklets for training and evaluation purposes, which is actually how we train our model um, in the first place. So to dive a little bit deeper into what is this dynamical system and, and how it works, say we have some car on the road with its state denoted by X at some time T. Then if you tell me the controls that you apply to this car, for example, you know, how much you, you step on the pedal and, and how much you turn, I can make a good estimate of where the car will be in the next time step with a dynamical system, which is really a function that maps the current state and control to the next time steps state. And if we do this process again, where you, know, you, you, you tell me the uh, acceleration and, and steering that you apply to this car, I could do this again to obtain the next state. And just like that, we have an agent tracker. So we can see here how this dynamical system can indeed produce you know, the, the, the same trajectory representation that most other methods produce. 
Now, to dive a little bit deeper into what this is exactly, MATS is a mixture of affine time varying systems. And taking one component of that, we have an affine time varying system. And in particular, this is that same functional uh, form that we saw in the, in the previous slides. But if we expand it out into its you know, full true functional form, we can see that it is indeed an affine system, which is time varying via those T superscripts. And here's what it looks like visualize, visualized graphically. It's a matrix vector equation that comprises of four terms. The first autonomous term models the evolution of the system without any input controls. The control term models the effect that the robot has on agents in the scene. The affine term is a mathematical necessity that's incurred by representing a nonlinear system in this affine structure. And the final term uh, contains our uncertainty about the future of the system. And importantly, while we know the states of all the agents in the system, we only know the control of the ego robot because we're only really uh, performing this from the perspective of the ego robot. And that's why the control term only has this one UR uh, gray square there. So now in order to obtain predictions and actually obtain our, our full representation, we just have to populate these A, B, C, and Q matrices. And we'll use an illustrative three agent system that contains our robot, a pedestrian, and a vehicle to show how this is done. With this many agents, we obtain the following block matrix structures. And what we can say immediately is that we know that these blue elements we can obtain from dynamics, which we can assume for certain types of agents. And additionally, we also know that other agents cannot directly affect the next state of the robot, since again, we know the robot's state and control, which along with the robot's dynamics, fully determine its next state. Thus, the rest of this first row in the A matrix is filled with zeros. So finally, all we need to learn are these remaining green terms from data. And since they represent, uh, since they represent agent agent interactions, we, we don't have a closed form uh, equation from dynamics. And for example, this A23 term, the way you can uh, interpret these indices, models the effect that the vehicle state, agent three, has on the pedestrian's next state, agent two. Now then, to answer our original question, is this a viable trajectory forecasting representation that is more useful for planning? It is. Mats can indeed produce the analytical multimodal predictions that we desire, although on the left I've just plotted uh, the most likely mode for ease of visualization, while being significantly more efficient to work with in downstream planning. And in the, in the example on the right, we're able to perform multimodal planning, producing three candidate motion plans, one for each of the top three most likely predictions of surrounding agents, online with just a CPU. And because of the math structure, we don't need a GPU or thousands of predictions samples as in prior work to achieve this. So the key takeaways here are that currently there's a mismatch between common prediction outputs, tracklets, and planning inputs, system dynamics. And to remedy this, we propose maths as a new trajectory forecasting out output representation based on system dynamics. And as we've seen, Mats enables the efficient evaluation of possible system evolutions, yielding significant reductions in planning and control complexity. So now we'll turn our attention upstream to the interface between perception and prediction. In particular, this is what the output of a typical perception stack might look like for a busy street. If you can see, each object of interest here on the left is marked with its most likely class, so this might be some small text, but here you can see that it says car, as well as the probability of being that class. So each of these boxes also have a number, which indicate the probability that it is that class. However, current trajectory forecasting methods only take in that most likely class and neglect any associated probabilities. And this is problematic in the face of uncertainty as it can lead to class switching during operation, as shown on the right here with this yellow taxi. So in particular, we can see that, you know, since classes are represented by color, since the class of this, the, the, the most likely class of this uh, vehicle is changing, it's, it's hovering right around, you know, 50% or whichever threshold you choose, we can see that it's really rapidly changing um, over time. Now, perception doesn't only classify agents, it also must detect and track them through time. And this is another source of uncertainty, which is currently unaccounted for in prediction. Here, I'm visualizing state estimations from a common probabilistic filtering scheme, which produces mean and variance information for each tracked black dot. 
However, most trajectory forecasting systems today only take the mean as input and neglect any uncertainty information. To remedy this, we've developed methods to incorporate both class and state uncertainty stemming from perception. However, in the interest of time, today I'll only focus on class uncertainty. To illustrate why taking the most likely class and facing class switches is a problem, here I'm going to show some predictions for Trajectron++ for a scene with the ego robot here in green, another vehicle uh, here in gray with its predictions in blue, and then a pedestrian here uh, on the bottom just walking towards the, the bottom of the figure. So when this vehicle is classified correctly, we can see that the predictions are reasonable, the uncertainty grows at like a normal rate. However, if this agent were now to be misclassified by accident as a pedestrian, this is what the output from Trajectron++ looks like, where the uncertainties are now really rapidly growing. And actually, these might cause our ego vehicle to have to enact some safety preserving maneuver for no reason at all. So in order to fix this, we're going to start with the original Trajectron++ plus plus architecture and think about how we can incorporate class uncertainty information. And the, the immediate way that we um, chose to do this is by directly inputting class distributions in, as input into both the node and neighbor history encoders, as well as making sure that the, that the, that the decoder is fully class agnostic, so it doesn't rely on any uh, hard class uh, information from perception. Now, thankfully, from a practical perspective, this change is quite simple. And the benefits of doing this are immediately apparent when we analyze predictions on an agent whose class we are very uncertain about. In particular, this green dot down here. So in particular, Trajectron++ really overconfidently overshoots the actual future uh, movement of this agent. And we can see that with this prediction that stretches way past the last point of the ground truth and with uh, lateral uncertainties that are very small, very tight. On the right side here, we can see that our method instead does not longitudinally overshoot and instead its uncertainties, its lateral uncertainty is actually quite reasonable given the fact that we don't really understand, we don't really know what type of class this agent is. And another really important thing that we found when we were working on this project is that incorporating class uncertainty actually enables performing counterfactual analyses or what if analyses. And to illustrate what that is, I'm gonna show it by way of this qualitative example where we have here a pedestrian on the bottom left just walking towards the bottom right, a parked car which is about to start moving and it's about to, to, to merge onto the road. And then we have some moving cars here moving to the bottom right. So these are what the predictions look like from our model when you just pass in the original detected probabilities from uh, perception. However, if I instead change all of those inputs into um, completely uncertain, completely uniform class distributions, we can really see that the, uh, the uncertainty in the predictions really grows. And this is encouraging because, for example, this pedestrian, while it might be moving slow now, if we have no idea what type of agent it is, it could be a car which starts to speed up in the future. And so actually, you can see that our predictions are now longitudinally longer to account for the fact that maybe there's a higher velocity uh, movement in the future from this agent. And also from this parked car, which is just barely moving forward, since we don't know what type of class uh, it is, it could just be a pedestrian, which is maybe slowly moving one way and then turning the other way. And actually we even have predictions that go backwards from where that agent currently is. And then finally on the right, we can see with these two vehicles, their lateral, the, the lateral uncertainty in their predictions has grown to account for the fact that maybe they could be fast moving vehicles that have a better turning radius than a car. Now, I can also do this the other way, where I can say, I can try and see what the predictions look like if all of the um, agents are certainly classified as pedestrians. And here, what we see really interestingly is for this, um, for the pedestrian, really nothing much changes. But for these agents on the right here, we can see that the, the, um, rather than having the longitudinal speed of a car uh, in the predictions, it's actually bringing back these predictions and as if these you know, vehicles might slow down in the future to kind of be, be more pedestrian-like. And something else that we can do, if we have here a very certain car, 
we can see what happens if we smoothly sweep the input probabilities, the detected probabilities for this agent, and see how the output predictions uh, respond. And we can actually see very nicely that when we smoothly interpolate the classification probability of this agent, the output is also smoothly interpolated in terms of being quite certain and quite tight around the, the fact that this agent moves forward to quite broad and, and actually having much longitudinal and lateral uncertainty about where the agent could be in the future. Finally, one of the toughest things about this project was first the lack of data uh, containing agent class probabilities from a perception stack. Currently, only a data set that's released by Lyft actually contains class probabilities. However, these class probabilities are extremely certain. And basically, every agent is classified with 100% certainty. And this makes it quite difficult to study um, what happens in the regime where you have uncertain perception. So this is why, in collaboration with the Toyota Research Institute, we're releasing a new data set called PUP, which to, to aid future researchers in studying perceptual uncertainty in prediction. And the PUP data set in particular contains raw, unfiltered agent class distributions from an industrial perception stack, with data being collected in Japan and elsewhere. And also, importantly, it has much more class diversity than the Lyft data set, which only has bicycles, cars, and pedestrians. So to, to step back a little bit, most trajectory forecasting approaches and public data sets currently neglect uncertainty in their inputs. And we found that extending trajectory on plus plus to take full distributions as input actually improves prediction accuracy, especially in the face of uncertainty, and enables abilities like counterfactual analyses. And finally, we introduced PUP, a real world driving data set with class uncertainties from an industrial perception stack to aid researchers in the future who wish to study the same topic. Finally, we tackle the problem of evaluation. In particular, how can we measure an autonomy stack module's integrated performance? And really what I mean here is that Typically, a lot of autonomy stack modules, such as perception or trajectory forecasting or elements within them, are developed independently and evaluated independently with you know, methods that are accuracy, metrics that are accuracy based, for example. And what this means is, you know, we might have a strong sense of how accurate some of these methods are in isolation, but it becomes difficult to quantify their performance on a downstream task when you do actually have to integrate them into an autonomous stack. And existing metrics that I mentioned earlier are purely accuracy-based, meaning they're really built to compare how close the trajectory produced by a method is to the ground truth, is to what actually happened. And I have here an illustration of quite a few uh, very common um, evaluation metrics for prediction methods. And really what you can see is that in all of them, the, any, any color red represents a prediction from a model and blue represents the ground truth actual trajectory that the, that the agent, or in this case, a vehicle enacted. And we can see that really what all of them are doing are computing some types of scores about how close these two are. Now, the same can even be said for perception evaluation, where here I'm showing on the right, the intersection over union metric or IOU which is a very common um, uh, object detector evaluation method. And the way that this works is you compare how close a bounding box is to the ground truth, i.e. in how close it is, how much it overlaps versus how much area they both uh, totally share in union. Now, the reason this is a problem and the reason why this task agnosticism doesn't account for downstream performance, I have an illustration here on the right of a a human-driven vehicle in gray that's about to turn right next to our ego vehicle in green. And I also have drawn here two predictions in purple and in green, which both have the exact same metric accuracy, at least in the sense of a final displacement error metric. The problem here is that although these both have metrically the exact same accuracy, one of them, this purple one in particular, might cause our uh, ego vehicle in order to enact a safety preserving maneuver in the future. Again, for really no reason other than a mistake in the prediction pipeline. However, this other green prediction is harmless and wouldn't affect our motion planning at all. And the same can be said for perception, 
where here we have in gray uh, a human uh, driven vehicle that we're trying to detect and the act its actual position. And then we have in purple and in green, two candidate detections that have the exact same intersection over union uh, metric value. And again, in the case of the purple one, our ego vehicle, which is driving up here from the bottom, needs to make some type of evasive maneuver. Uh, whereas in the other case, it would just harmlessly pass through the intersection. So to start, we first thought of the core desiderata that we're looking for in any metric that would classify it as task aware. And in this first point, this is really targeting that uh, problem that I was describing earlier, where we want to be able to capture asymmetries in downstream tasks. And in the second point, and perhaps the most important point, while we want these metrics to be task aware, it's actually quite important that they're also method agnostic. And the reason I say this is because we don't want to develop a metric that only works, for example, if your planner, if you're using RRT star as a planner which doesn't help those who are using other planning approaches or even you know, are not even using a sampling-based um, motion planning architecture. Uh, the third point here is basically covering the fact that you know, a lot of these evaluation methods are run over very large data sets uh, in the real world. And so we really want them to be computationally feasible to compute so that they can actually run in you know, reasonable time. And you don't, you don't have to do something like solve some very difficult optimization problem in order to obtain uh, this you know, single metric value. And finally, we would want a task or metric to be interpretable, because then at least in this case, you're able to um, you know, understand both why your method might not be performing well and how to improve it. And with these in mind, we came up with the following evaluation scheme that is our suggestion for how to incorporate task awareness in existing metrics. So starting from a data set of real world human motion over here uh, illustrated on the left and a set of cost function terms phi with arguments XR, state of the robot, UR, its control, and X hat, which represents the estimated locations of other agents, at least in the current time step, and predictions of where they might be in the future capital T time steps. We take this information and we pass it through a continuous inverse optimal control algorithm which produces weights theta that additively combine these cost function terms to create our, a final cost function C, whose minimization well reproduces the original human motion data. And we do this whole process to learn this proxy cost function for two main reasons. The first is that we're working with a planning cost function in order to maintain task agnosticism and not choose a specific planner. And in particular, working with a specific planner is, very is a very tempting choice here because most companies that are developing an autonomy stack or even most groups that are developing an autonomy stack will have a specific planner in mind that they want to use and might want to just directly pass perception and trajectory forecasting uh, outputs through the motion planning architecture in order to see how the resulting uh, motion plans uh, perform. The reason why this is a problem is that you can run into a moving goalposts problem where you know, you're planning and control team might be updating this code daily or weekly. And then you know, through no fault of your own, your predictor or detector might be performing significantly worse, significantly better, or the same week in, week out without any, you know, without any changes that are related to you know, how the trajectory forecasting method itself works. And second, the second reason we do this is that we don't want to use a cost function of an existing planner in order to again maintain task agnosticism since a specific planner's cost function might harm the generalization of this method to practitioners which use other planning approaches. And, and really, at a high level, we just want to well reproduce the original human motion. And we want to do this because the next step in our process is to take the magnitude of the gradient of this cost function C with respect to these estimates of detections and predictions X hat. And what this value gives us is a sense of planning sensitivity, which is really how sensitive the ego robots planning is to changes in the detections and forecasted trajectories of other agents. And this planning sensitivity value is exactly what we're going to be using to bring planning awareness into existing perception and prediction evaluation metrics. So, okay, there's a lot of moving parts here. So I think we need to first take a step back and, and think, okay, can we actually do, you know, any of this? Can we actually come up with this cost function, which reasonably 
uh, uh, shows human motion? And can we then, you know, are these planning sensitivities even, you know, is this gradient even useful for us? So to evaluate this, we started by taking, well, the new scenes data set again as a set of human motion data, and then some cost function terms such as lane deviation, control effort, collision avoidance, and others. And we ran them through our that uh, continuous inverse optimal control method that I uh, mentioned earlier in order to obtain a combined cost function C. Now, to actually observe how faithfully this reproduces human motion, we're going to optimize this and compare it to uh, the ground truth human motion on a held out test data set. And we can see here in blue is the actual motion that an agent moved through the scene. And in green is the result of our optimization of this cost function C. And as we can see, they're really close to each other, which is really encouraging because we, again, we want this to represent real human motion so we can then see what factors influence human motion. And even quantitatively, when you look over, when I looked over um, the average maximum error for uh, this data set that I ran it on, I found that you know it was on average about 60 centimeters, which is quite close. Now, okay, we have a cost function, but really we now need to see how good uh, is this idea of, of taking the gradients in order to obtain this measure of planning sensitivity. And I'm gonna show an example for detection first, where here we have our ego vehicle in orange. I'm gonna show this on the, on the left figure. And we have detections made by uh, an existing method called the MEGV detector that are in red or with the colors scaling from red to yellow, depending on how planning sensitive that detection is. And then we also have ground truth uh, agent like positions in blue. So here we can see already immediately that our method is able to identify that this false positive, which is very nearby the ego vehicle, uh, it's the ego vehicle is highly planning sensitive to it. And the same can be said for this example here, where we have something that looks like a falsely detected bicycle, very close to the ego vehicle. And our method is able to capture the fact that it is something that would you know, highly affect motion planning. And we can actually do the exact same thing for prediction. And in this case here, Agents, other agents are marked by blue um, dots and their actual futures are marked by the solid blue lines. And the colors here scale from blue to red, depending on how planning sensitive um, that, you know, that agent's future is. And I'm gonna take this interesting, you know, while there are quite a few interesting cases that we can look at, I'm gonna take one in particular on the top right here, where these two pedestrians are trying to, you know, they're about to turn right to move onto this crosswalk in order to cross the street here. And I mean, this is uh, certainly going to affect the ego vehicle as it has to actually slow down in order to uh, allow these to pass. And so we can actually see that our method captures the fact, you know, by these colors, that these will affect the ego vehicle's future motion plan. So now that we have this planning sensitivity values, we need to actually see about how to inject uh, this value and therefore planning awareness into existing metrics. And we thought of two ways that we can do this. The first is internally, for example, changing internal metric thresholds based on planning sensitivity. And here I have precision recall curves, which is a very common way of evaluating uh, detection methods in the real world. And what I'm doing here is internally, what, how you, you know, you need to classify if something is a true positive, like a correct detection or not. And what we can see here is in order to inject task awareness, something that we can do is change this threshold of what counts as a true detection or not, which is usually done by a threshold on the intersection over union value uh, that you get from a bounding box on top of uh, the actual agent position. So this is one way that we can do this. Another way is externally, where we can do something like striding metric values based on the Eagle Robot's planning sensitivity to an existing agent. And in particular, what I'm showing here is the performance of Trajectron++, again, on the new scenes data set, on the left here in vehicles and on the right here in pedestrians. And especially I'm, I'm looking at its prediction errors on different kinds of agents. And quite encouragingly, we can see that for agents which the ego vehicle is highly planning sensitive to, Trajectron++ plus plus actually produces its best prediction performance. So the key takeaways here are that most detection and prediction metrics are task agnostic and they neglect task-specific outcome asymmetries. And really to address this, we need new task-aware metrics that are necessary to evaluate 
um, autonomy stack modules accounting for these outcome asymmetries. And towards this end, we propose planning sensitivity as a way to inject task awareness in existing evaluation metrics. Now, we've covered quite a lot uh, through this talk so far, uh, starting with methods for trajectory forecasting, methods for integrating better representations throughout the autonomy stack, and methods for evaluating these autonomy stack modules in a, method, in, in a way that's cognizant of their downstream performance. Now, having said that, there's still such a wide variety of future directions from here. In particular, one of them is uncertainty calibration. So I know that I mentioned a lot of the time here that uh, you know these methods produce distributions, they're multimodal, and there's a mean and variance of some Gaussian, but who's to say that these values are actually mean anything? And I want to give a shout out to Rachel Wu, who's actually a, a fellow lab mate in ASL, who's doing some of this work right now. And, and I think this work is really important to ensure that the values that we're outputting are actually meaningful. Another key future direction is module co-design. So I, I alluded to the fact that you know, a lot of autonomy stack modules are, are developed independently and then integrated later after the fact. And the question here is, you know, is there a way that we can develop some metric and, and maybe even using our own, uh, uh, our own way of incorporating planning awareness into metrics, does this ensure good system performance if you have a good metric value in this, um, you know, with this new metric? Uh, third, here we have information representation. And throughout this talk, I kind of implicitly used a specific uh, representation of the environment around the robot. And I did this by using words like bounding box or you know, specific agents. And this is something that's very commonly known as an object-centric representation. However, this is not the only type of representation that you can have uh, that comes out of perception. What about something like occupancy maps, or which are basically probability distributions of where things could be in the scene, or maybe some hybrid representation? And it's, it's really still uh, an open question as to which of these is best and which one maintains the most information through the autonomy stack. And finally, here we have some interesting uh, you know, possibilities for feedback loops within the autonomy stack. You know, for example, comparing the observed motion of some agent versus what we expected, uh, how we expected it would move from prediction. And maybe you know doing something like reconciling these by passing information like this up to perception in order to maybe correct its classification values or something like this. So having said that, I want to now thank a few people who made all this possible. And in particular, I want to start with my committee. Uh, Professor Kennedy, I want to thank you so much for chairing my defense today. I'm really glad that you said yes, especially because we actually have a lot of overlapping interests in human robot interaction. And I hope that you've settled in nicely to being a professor here these past few years. Michael, I want to thank you for your infinitely positive energy, your scary but necessary quals practice sessions, and for advising fantastic students. I really enjoyed working with Masha, and I learned a lot from everyone in Sizzle. Dorsa, first and foremost, I want to thank you for all of your efforts on the 274 course series. It's, it's a special beast. <laughs> And I also want to thank you for your excellent job talk back in 2017. Uh, I think it was 2017. It was one of the first talks I attended at Stanford, and it really opened my eyes to the problem of human-robot interaction. Mac, I want to thank you uh, for your extremely warm presence and willingness to dive into the details of whatever we worked on together, uh, from those first TRI meetings to working alongside Haruki, who I, again, also must thank you for advising. He's amazing, and working with him has absolutely enriched my life. I also want to give a special shout out to uh, Adrian Gaidon, who I looked up to as a second advisor on many of our projects and whose mind is basically overflowing with deep insights that I constantly learn from. And then last and definitely most, Marco, you know, many of my fellow lab mates, thank you for taking a chance on them. But in my case, I want to thank you for literally arguing for my presence here and really sticking your neck out for me to actually have this opportunity. These past years have truly been the best in my life, and, and I can't thank you enough for that. I really look forward to working with you together in the future, as well as other ASL members. Now, I also want to thank all of my co-authors, without whom literally none of this would have been possible. I love how collaborative research can be, and even actually making this slide, I was like, oh my god, like, this isn't even, a, I think, a complete list of everyone I've worked with. 
Uh, and, and, you know, working with everyone here has been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Uh, it made these years so enjoyable, even when we were in lab way past midnight, or for some reason, having ridiculously spicy chicken in lab together for dinner. Uh, next, I want to thank the ASL in its entirety. Uh, the Autonomous Systems Lab here has been the best second family that I could have ever asked for. I mean, with which other group can you go skiing, judge super fancy cars, although the amazing Dynamic Design Lab might have something to say about that, climb mountains, have huge Italian dinners, demolish other Aero Astro Labs in soccer, and experience your first American Friendsgiving. I also want to give a big thanks to my fellow AA274 TAs and students. It was amazing seeing everyone's progress, and it really makes me happy hearing that actually some have developed a passion for robotics after taking it. Also, it's one of the rare classes I can think of, which are character builders for both the students and the teaching staff. <laughs> um, now, uh, with all of my friends here, both at Stanford and, and around the world, I know they say that it takes a village to raise a PhD student, but at this point, it's probably a small city for me. And all of my friends are absolutely integral to it. And whether it be in lab or on the tennis court, at a conference, a hiking trail, or you know, over Zoom, I feel really lucky to have met all of you and known you during this time. And, and I can't wait to catch up uh, really soon, actually, after this final push. Finally, my family. You guys have been my guiding lights, my strongest advocates therapists, life coaches, and funniest comedians through everything. And I can't wait to see you again really soon. P.S. My brilliant brother is applying to grad schools this year. So keep an eye out for his application in case uh, you're on the lookout for good students. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions now. I think, yeah, the way that we can do this is either you can type your question in chat or maybe do the little like raise hand thing and then Ed can, uh, Ed can um, unmute you. Any and I've questions? Even... Oh, go for it. No, I was just gonna say, I've even allowed uh, Unmuting now in case you want to just unmute rather than chat. Yeah, go for it, Marco. I was just soliciting soliciting questions. I have a question. It's Sasha. Go for it. Um, great presentation. Congratulations. Uh, I really found your idea about evaluating um, according to planning sensitivity really interesting. I was wondering if uh, you think that it could cause um, downstream models and uh, robot behavior to be too aggressive because models would be sort of engineered to be uh, predicting uh, or detecting objects in a more conservative way. So do you think that could potentially uh, result in more aggressive systems? And if so, how could we mitigate that? This is a great question. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and actually, I'm glad you asked this because I think it's a common, it's, it's definitely like one of the first outcomes that comes to mind when, when, when you're, especially when you're changing how certain things are evaluated. And I'm gonna bring up this slide again, just to, to, to have this illustration here. And I think the way that we can mitigate this, like directly at the metrics level, and then maybe even upstream in, in the, the models and, and how you're using them, there's two ways that we can do this. So although here I've shown that, for example, you know, you might evaluate this metric, like, sorry, this prediction in purple here differently than this green prediction. What you can also do, because we're here in the land of metrics, where you're able to use the actual future information that's available to, like, in, in a data set, what you can do is rather than measuring the sensitivity of these predictions, you can measure the sensitivity of the ground truth future. And the reason you might want to do this is because if a ground truth, like if the agent is anyways going to pass you know, nearby or it's going to pass somewhat 
uh, relatively close to the Eagle vehicle, any prediction here, you should kind of view as important. It, it's, it's quite important to get it correct. And I mean, the, the exact same thing could be said for detection. So on, on a, like a pure practitioner level, um, this would be one way where like, if you're gonna use a metric like this, rather than looking at, for example, you know, weighing certain predictions uh, more or less, depending on their planning sensitivity, you can weigh an agent's, like the predictions of an agent more or less based on its, you know, its own upcoming planning sensitivity. So I think this is like one super direct way of doing that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, there, there's quite a few other methods upstream, you know, for example, in the way that you, you know, rather than looking at like maybe a specific average value, you can maybe look at distributions of errors here, you know, maybe doing something like that external, um, like that external method that I was mentioning where, um, you know, you can look at metric values that are, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here, metric values that are, um, like striated based on the type of agent. So here you can also just get a sense of how your method performs without necessarily having to, for example, you know, change its output. Well, really the, the like a way to cheat this, for example, would be to make your predictions perform super well on highly planning sensitive agents, which I think is probably the goal anyways. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's all I wanna say about that right now. Thanks, congrats again. Thanks. Boris, you have a question in the chat from Parasto, and then Adrian has raised his hand. Yep, I'm, I'm gonna read it out loud as well. Um, yeah, you talked about how incorporating class uncertainty or trajectory forecasting enabled counterfactual analyses. I was wondering, can you talk more about how you have or, or might have used this counterfactual analysis? This is a, a, another great question. Yeah, so this is, this is also like, you know, when you, when you have like a new, like the ability to do something like this, then it's, it's definitely the first question is like, okay, well, you know, how, how do we use it? How do we do anything here with this? And I think one of the, one of the main use cases that immediately comes to my mind at least is in simulation or in stress testing. I mean, both of these are kind of offline, you know, simulation slash evaluation methods for autonomy stacks, but something you could do, for example, is, you know, let's say you, you can, I'll give an example of like replaying, let's say a car driving through an intersection or something like that. And what you can do is maybe try and inject some faults into the perception stacks uh, outputs. Like, you know, maybe th this, you know, it, it said really certainly because there's some agent near a, you know, maybe a camera boundary and it's, it's kind of uncertain. What if it was, you know, wrong? What if the classification was, uh, the probabilities were this or this or this or whatever, you know, some values like this. Then you're actually able to offline determine what your, you know, how your trajectory forecasting method would perform in these scenarios. And so I think one, like definitely one big application point here is into something like simulation or stress testing. Thank you for that question. Um, Adrian, go for it. Hi. Hey, Boris. Um, yeah, first of all, congratulations. Uh, thank you for the kind words and really just, you've been a stellar collaborator. Uh, I feel very privileged to have been able to work with you. Um, and really impressed by both your energy and your ability to cover like such a crazy range of topics, you know, like from voodoo deep learning to very rigorous control. Uh, and that's the kind of like doing the splits like this, it's, it's kind of amazing to be able to do that. So really heartfelt um, congratulations. And I have one question which I'm, I'm really curious about because again, like you're one of the few people in the world that has been able to do the splits between the voodoo deep learning and the rigorous control. So one of the things that I'm wondering is how far do you think we can go in terms of uh, safety insurances for learned systems when we can combine this best of both worlds of like known dynamics, control knowledge, and data? How, how far do you think we can go? Yeah, I yeah, this is this is a I mean basically a field probably in and of itself, and I think especially the one of the works that I mentioned. I mean, I, I, we can even start as something as direct as something like uh, talking about uncertainty calibration, where you know, already we have this mismatch of like control, you know, you can have hard constraints, which are like, okay, I want to avoid the three sigma boundary and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if your prediction method doesn't even know what probabilities even, you know, what these values are even amounting to, you have this big mismatch. So something that I've learned, at least from like, as you say, like the voodoo deep learning stuff, I actually have, you know, grown a big appreciation for actually 
reducing what you leave to machine learning. So to show an example of this, like, like, yeah, sure. Like you can make predictions that directly are in position space and they just do everything for you. Like they go from pixels to, to output. But I think what I found is like, actually, if you slowly just like erode, like, like you just take one little thing, like, you know, we know how dynamics work. So we don't really need the model to learn that when you like take away something like this, and then you see the performance increase, it's kind of showing you that like, you're kind of unburdening these, let's say voodoo deep learning models. And this is where I think really like controls and machine learning play together really well is where you don't need to like overstep, you don't need to like do the job of controls in machine learning. You can simply use, I mean, even, I mean, even learning a like nonlinear like polynomial to fit some data that you've observed to then use online to, I don't know, compute slip, angle on like a drifting car that's already like that capability alone is like wildly useful and you don't need to do something like have a you know a a motion planning neural network that like drives the car for you so i think it's one of these things where it's like you know for me it's been always like a question of understanding what machine learning can do for you understanding what controls and planning and other like rigor you know optimization can do for you and then when you meet in the middle trying to define these kind of, you know, what do we need, you know, can we, can we impose structure? Can we learn something that's like a, you know, can we learn like a positive semi-definite matrix? Can we learn, you know, something which at least constrains us a little bit without kind of going to the super big wild land of like, well, the output is the output and I have no idea what it could be. So I think this is one of these things where it's like, you, you got to start from here and then maybe we can build theories around there and then just slowly chip away to expand, you know, what machine learning can do while maintaining guarantees. Awesome. You might have just created a subfield of machine learning that would be called machine not learning. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Boris, for the great answer. And congrats again on the great presentation. Thanks, Andrew. And then we have a question here from Joshua Ott. Hey, Boris. Uh, first of all, awesome job. That was really interesting. Um, my question was that you mentioned uh, in the Trajectron++ discussion that your uh, that essentially there's the EKF predict step. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the similarities and differences there, Trajectron++ plus plus and the EKF, and then some of the strengths and weaknesses associated with that. So it's kind of like, you know, it's a very funnily overloaded term because, I mean, I say it's a common, it's, it's like a common filter because at least the equations are like kind of the same, but really, what is the common filter predict step? Well, it's like using linear Gaussian update equation or like linear Gaussian equations. And so the, the core differences here is that when I am doing something like this in trajectory forecasting, all I'm doing is basically like a pure uncertainty propagation step. I'm taking the uncertainty that's predicted, you know, in like a, in a control sense, and I'm, I'm propagating that up into like through the dynamics into position space. So that's at least like in a trajectory forecasting case, this is exactly what uh, we're doing here. In an actual common filter, you have this like predict and then you have this update step where basically you're, you're and you know, one of the famous things is that it has this common gain and et cetera, which is basically as you're observing points online, it's kind of, you're making updates to your estimate of uncertainty. And then, you know, you're, 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 you're like as I showed in that other kind of moving little the estimates, they will kind of change and, and shrink or maybe grow based on what you've observed. Here, this is like a purely open loop uh, uncertainty propagation step, whereas the common filter has a bit more of that. Like it's, it's actually taking into account the difference in what it observed versus what it predicted. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Boris, you have another question in the chat? Yep, uh, I'll read it out. There are quite a few here, but that's okay. So thank you for the very interesting talk. You used generative models to produce predictions. Do you know any criterion or how many samples should be used with these methods? Is this a problem or is this always really fast? And a si okay, this is a great question. Uh, yeah, can you use your method for measuring prediction impact on planning to orient sampling towards those interesting samples? This is a great question. And actually something that I wanna show, oh, of course, I don't have it here, but that's okay. So something that I'm really happy about with this work and actually, the, the fact that we used, and I'll come actually even back to this slide. What I'm really happy about is that in this work, we use like a discrete latent spaced conditional variational autoencoder. And what's really nice about this 
is that I actually, to make predictions, I don't do any sampling at all. Really, because we have a discrete latent space, and in particular, it's actually quite a small latent space. It's only, let's say, 25 nodes or something like that. I can fully enumerate the space. I can literally, like, in the probability uh, distribution like uh, formula, I can literally just write out directly mode, you know, the, the, the probability of the first mode times the Gaussian distribution for that mode plus the probability of the second mode, et cetera. You effectively get a Gaussian mixture model at every time step. And so you can actually use that full distribution without needing to, um, to do any sampling yourself. You can, of course, you can do sampling if your method necessitates it. And for example, this is actually something that Haruki uh, did himself when, when, he was, when we were working together to, to produce plans. But something actually that I also want to point out to in terms of runtime, everything, you know, because we're not doing samples, everything actually runs quite fast, even for quite large scenes. And I mean, I'm, I, I know these numbers I'm showing are for like, you know, they're, they're not like 100 hertz or something, but, you know, again, I'm running them on a laptop and, and et cetera. And it's not using, you know, Tensor RT or something fancy. So actually, we're able to do this, you know, pretty fast and, and pretty reasonably uh, without too much. Uh, impact here. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. I have a... Oh yeah, sure, let's go ahead. And yeah. then probably it's time to wrap up. Sure, this is a quick kind of follow-up. Maybe I, maybe I missed it, but you you lever, uh, leverage a lot of data sets that have a lot of structure and have people kind of driving in somewhat kind of nice places, right? Where, where there's not too much chaos going on. And I'm really curious, how, how might you have to change your method or would it just work out of the box for really chaotic situations or, you know, like, like uh, some really complex human robot interaction uh, that's not just traffic. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So there's uh, two answers I can give you. A quick one, which is that one of the best and worst things about deep learning is you will always get an output. doesn't matter what you put in, you will always get an output. It could be garbage, but you, you know. So this is one of those classic things of like, you will always get some output. It will always work out of the box. The question is if it's well or not. Now, to, to develop this a little bit more, the good thing is, and unfortunately, I didn't have these like in the slide, but actually, we also evaluated, for example, trajectory on plus plus, on predicting the future motion of huge sets of pedestrians, like you know, like like university students mingling and walking in like a quad, like 50, 60, 70 pedestrians walking through, and that at least there was a pretty unstructured environment compared to you know, as you say, compared to driving with lanes and, and etc. But I think. The one hope that I would have as like as like a like a, someone who's developing these models, I would really hope that my model learns like the fundamental interactions between agents and like the fundamental like drivers of what you know future motion will come out. And I mean, obviously, you know, your hope is that when you use large enough data sets and you you kind of you don't use some super massive overfitting model, but something that's a little bit I mean, you know, directional plus was actually quite a small model. You hope that it can really glean this kind of fundamental interaction, which then hopefully allows it to be applied into like completely different environments and, and work just fine. You know, if we're talking into kind of scenarios where, you know, there, there's now, for example, maybe like, uh, you know, vehicles that you've never seen before, like, I don't know, like tuk-tuks in Thailand or something like that, or, or whatever, then I think here is where, you know, I kind of put my hands up and say, well, this is like an out of domain example. And I think we then need to look into research, which is, for example, uh, doing maybe a little bit of online learning or doing a little bit of like online adaptive fine tuning in order to basically have your base model and then your like learning online model basically able to reason about new things that it sees without having no idea with what, uh, what to do with them. So I think that it's kind of a multi-pronged answer, but it's, it's, a, it's a big question as well. All right, shall we wrap up? Uh, and move to the private session. Sounds good. Yep, I think, you, does everyone here have the link for that one? Excellent. Uh, yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so yeah, Ed, feel free to start.